time, as well as things I found really annoying was when I started working with the number of legal documents that I had to read and patents and agreements with other companies and non disclosures and so on. If you're just in that language, that's a good skill. Um, the other thing I thought I was thinking to do just before we get started all this is to talk about this concept of the interest rate and the effective interest rate and the uh, so um, I had a number of questions on that based on the tutorial last month. So I hadn't planned to teach this material. This is a topic actually is intended for self-study. But um, given the volume of questions on that, let's, let's take a look at it. So if you have um, a credit card, for example, you'll have a nominal interest rate. So let's call our nominal Self-periods is if, if your interest rate, the normal interest rate, is 24% per annum, but your credit card company is charging you monthly, they're using 12 sub-periods. And we're saying, well, what's the effective interest rate you're paying when you're compounding over those sub-periods? You, you, you charge a nominal rate on paper, but there's actually an effective interest rate when you go to smaller sub-periods and you charge what they usually do is they say, uh, it's called cool, the sub-period interest rate. It's called cool, I subscript S. And usually that's simply equal to the interest rate that you see on paper, the nominal, divided by the number of sub-periods. So if your credit card nominal rate is 24%, doing it over 12 months, your sub-period interest rate is then a flat 10%. But now the point that we're trying to make here is that if your credit card company is charging you 2% a month, but then compounding that over the sub-periods, 12 sub-periods, your effective interest rate that you're paying is greater, smaller, than the nominal paper rate, than the nominal rate, greater. Okay, because your, the example is I was saying to the student earlier is, if you had a balance of $1,000 on your credit card and you chose not to pay it anything off, you're going to be charged that monthly percentage. So let's take this example of 24 divided by 12, so you're going to be charged 2% on $1,000. Then next month, you're going to be charged the $1,000 plus the 2% interest, and then another 2% compounded onto that. If you let, keep that going and not pay your credit balance off for, for 12 months, you're going to have some balance on your credit card account that's accumulated, and that effective interest rate that you are really being ended up billed for is going to be much greater than the 24% paper rate, uh, nominal rate, let's take it paper. Okay. So how do we go calculate what that effective interest rate is? Well, it's very straightforward, and I must apologize yesterday to Angel. She was arriving on the board and I said, no, 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 you're wrong, but she's actually right. Mm -hmm. uh, where is she? Okay, so, and, and so uh, what, what the derivation is the following. Let's say, Again, let's call that the balance of the n periods at rate by s. So we're being charged the sub period interest rate. What is the balance after n such periods? Well, that's your initial amount that you had multiplied by the compound interest formula i, 1 plus i such as s to the power n. So the balance you're going to see in your credit card 12 months into the future, or some number of months and into the future, is whatever it was multiplied by the compound interest rate that you're being charged with in each sub period raised to the number of periods that you've been billed for. <coughs> what we're 
trying to find is the same thing, what is that same future balance if we had to put it in the same amount but over one period? So what is that effective interest rate that you could have been billed for instead in one period on the same base investment, the same base amount? Okay, so these two are equal. We're going to equate them and solve for IS in terms of IE. What should the sub-period interest rate be to calculate the effective interest rate, or what is the effective interest rate given some sub-period interest rate? Conversely, you could ask, what should the, if the bank really did play fair, so that the normal interest rate matched my effective interest rate, you could ask, well, what should the sub-period rate be that they should bill me for to get an, a, a nominal interest rate or an effective interest rate then of uh, 24%? Uh, so to solve that in reverse, then introduce the second equation, I such so as S is equal to over a 12-month period, that's 0.24 effective interest rate plus one, take the root of that minus one. Should that be greater or, or smaller than 22%? That's some period rate. What should I get? Should I get a value greater than two, less than two? Less than two is 1.808.
power company generating all that electricity and then being billed for the, again, the income only once at the end of the year. We're saying clearly that's an unfair way. But our time value of money we were saying is 10%. Let's say we wanted to move to monthly periods or even weekly periods. What should be the interest rate we should use within each of those now smaller sub-periods so that still our overall time value of money, our effective time value of money, I think would be is 10%. So then I could use this equation and say, I want to know what my sub-period interest rate should be so that I still get an overall 10% annual time value of money, but I'm recognizing that I'm now moving to smaller sub-periods. So it doesn't change anything we've learned. It's just saying, how do we relate um, taking our fairly coarse timeline over here, and now we want to see it in, in a more detailed resolution. We know that we have to use a different interest rate. What should that interest rate be? So that's effectively given one period. So this M is the number of subdivisions within one of the bigger periods we would make. So that's the take a look at this equation here. I'm saying I've got N subperiods that I want to compound over a certain amount. And I want to equal that to as if I had used one interest rate over one period. So it's the power one. So I'm dividing one period into n smaller periods. What's the relationship between the overall interest, the effective interest rate over one period versus the subdivided? Due to compounding, it's not just a straight division by the number of periods. Thank you. 
So this question also came up in the tutorial in question three where a company was investing uh, 600,000 and then there was those inflows, where's the break even point? We did that for system A and B. And you calculated,
top I've got my that the, the cash flow of ninety nine thousand So that the present value is the same. In the second period, that twenty thousand inflow is worth less. The forty thousand in periods two, three, and four are, are worth less and less and less as time progresses. And then that final inflow of thirty thousand is worth about half the value. So by some all of those those six terms up, I compute a net present value of twenty thousand dollars. So that's uh, corresponding to the slide. Yeah? So uh, you can uh, reproduce the slide for yourself. $20,600. The question is, what does that mean? How do you interpret that in PD value? Anyone want to discuss it maybe with the person next to you for a minute? How do you, what way do you interpret that $20,000 that you're at? Simply, I'm not just to say that's the net present value. I know that. But what, how can you describe that more carefully? If your manager is saying, you know, we're, you've given me this flow sheet or this uh, spreadsheet where you've got an NPV of 20,000. Can you explain it to me a little bit more carefully? What do you, what do you say to your manager? Just t take a minute to, to uh, tell your neighbor what you think it is, and then we'll get some answers. Of the, of the Chinese company investing in system A or B, 
Um, we had break, so the payback time was somewhere here in this period for the two projects. So if we take time value of money to account, the DS takes account of the present value for each of the periods, and I've got the cumulative sum running now in that final row. So essentially, I'm calculating my NPV. If I go with uh, system A, there was a seven-year payback period. So that's why you see after the seven, after this final six period, there's zero in here. So this cumulative value doesn't change by any amount after it. The reason why I've gone out further is I wanted to make a comparison to the second project. The second project had a service life that was longer. So yes, it costs you less money up front. It also gets you less savings for each of the periods. So we're, over, we're costing us only 100 compared to the 500. Our savings, though, are 15,000 per period. But those savings continue for 15 years. It goes over to the final, final period. So here, in terms of the NPV for system A, is $7,569. So the NPV for the second system B is $48,480. So these are the values that most of the groups had yesterday in the tutorial. Which project is a better project to pick? B. B is definitely a better project, because from the definition we have now, that you should view NPV as your profit taking into account the time value of money, you're going to derive a higher profit from installing and tuning system B over system A. Our payback time for system A is shorter. So if you look at it purely from a payback time point of view, A is better than B. But the shortcoming of payback time on system A is one that doesn't take time value of money into account. And even if you do, it's still uh, it's, it's fairly nebulous because the payback time isn't the whole picture. Here we see in the comparison that this one system keeps generating revenue for you or savings for you over a longer period. So that even though it takes a longer time to pay itself back, the net profit to you, taking time value of money into account, is greater. Okay, so from that point of view, NPV should be used rather than, than the payback time. Unfortunately, payback time we discussed in our class is very widely used because it's easy to understand. It's easy for people to pick up the concept. It's much harder to go say to your boss, the NPV is $50,000 positive. It's, 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 people <coughs> find that harder to, to interpret. But to say payback time is seven years, that sits easy with people and an intuitive feeling for that. NPV numbers are not so, so intuitive. So very clear that NPV is the net profit to be used given the time value of money. Uh, the other way you can see it explicitly with this example is um, I, I put here, the, here we, when I calculated the NPV of 20,000, I was using the net cash flow. So minus 91 plus 20 is 40, 40, and we, we calculate time value of money. Some then we get 20,000. But another way to, to just make it even more explicit that this, this is a net profit is, let me break up my cash flows out, separate from my cash flows in, and just count them separately. So here's my cash flow out of 91,000. And then in future periods, I have no further investment required in this piece of equipment running. It doesn't cost me any more other than that initial payment to install and keep the equipment going. Which is not true, actually, for most cases. There's often the upkeep in many cases. Then there's your cash flows in. You get no money in your first period, but then I get 20, 40, 40, 40, 30,000 in the subsequent periods. So I can go take time value of money on each one of these cash flows out. So obviously the zeros remain zero. So I take time value of money on my cash flows in. And if I sum across that second row, I get 91,093 as the sum of all present values of cash flows out. And then in the final row, I get the sum of all cash flows in, taking their present values in. The sum of all present values of all cash flows in. And I simply do a subtraction of that. The sum of all present values of cash out, that neg that minus that from the sum of all present values of cash flows in. So cash flows in, present value, minus cash flows out, present value, in minus out equals the profit. So this is essentially the present value of the profit. So it's a trivial example in this case because my inflows are all in, in those periods, my outflows are in this period. But 
more complicated, complicated cash flows are going to be coming up uh, in the next few weeks, especially when we start to take taxes and depreciation into account. So right now, we're making some very crude assumptions here. No taxes, no depreciation, 100% certainty on what those dollar figures are in the future, and 100% certainty on the timeline of the our timeline that we're going up to. Those things are never known in practice, so we're going to get uh, quite quite more complicated quite quickly. But that's why I really want you to understand this breakdown. Take your present values of cash flows out and put those, sum them up, present values of cash flows in, and the difference between them is your present value of your profit. And that's what you see here. Do you see that? Okay, easy, easy concept to understand. This class shouldn't be hard, especially after the tutorial yesterday. Um, the tutorial was designed to help introduce some of this. <laughs> so now the next question is, well, given all the certainty here, I know my cash flows out, I know my cash flows in, I know that I'm, I'm five years, yeah, five, six years, uh, five, uh, n equals five periods. The next question that, that comes up is, well, what interest rate could I use to get a cash flow, a net profit, accounting for time value of money, so that my net profit is exactly zero. Okay, that, so let's say we've assumed time value of money is 15%, yeah? but if I put a time value of money of 20%, is that present value going to go up? That net profit going to go up or is it going to go down? Why down? Discounting more, what is being discounted more in this particular example? The tax flows and the big expense. Right, so in this example, we're front loading the project with a big expense that's not being discounted at all because it has to be time zero. So I put a, a higher interest rate here. I'm discounting cash flows that are coming in the future, incomes. Those incomes are being discounted to a greater extent. So if I'm getting less income, I've still got the same expense. My profit, NPV profit, has to go down. So 0.2, that drops down to 7,000 now from the 20,000 that I had originally. Here's the original example. Here's the modified. So let's uh, let's just make a subtract this a bit. Exactly a perfect candidate for secret method. 
which is how financial calculation uh, software does solve, solves this. Goal seek in Excel, uh, we do something similar. I presume they don't really say how it works. Where is goal seek again?
we would go for this project because it's greater than the company's minimal acceptable rate of return. So they are different, but it's saying this is my time value of money rate in which I get zero. I, I made neither a profit nor a loss. The fact that it's greater than my minimal acceptable rate. So let's say if we're saying asking the question, what if if this number came out lower than I? Okay, let's say the NPV that gave me a break-even point of zero dollars came out to be lower than twenty percent. It's saying that the time value of money that I've used to get to that break-even point is lower than the minimum acceptable rate that's required by the company. So in other words, from the company's perspective, anything that's going to generate at lower than 20% is making a loss for them. In, it may not be a, a, a dollar that is a loss, but their idea of a loss is anything lower than 20%. We'll, we'll, we'll clarify that in the part. If a project is generating a revenue or uh, generating a profit or at least breaking even at a, at a percentage rate higher than that, they're going to be making at least some money based on this. People are, uh, this is confusing, yeah. People are shaking their heads, no? Not agreeing? It seems counterintuitive because of this. Yeah. It seems like if I go to a higher percentage, I'm going to generate a negative. Yeah? No, just, it kind of makes sense. Like a break even uh, TMB just says that this project is better than. Any project with a smaller <coughs> of return than 23.6%. So if your company usually invests in projects that are 20% return, then this project could make even more money. That's, That's a nice way to say it. So let's take a look at that. Um, do you want to say it again? Okay, so basically any project that has a smaller TMV than this, the 23.6%, right. is an inferior project compared to so a company who's, if, if, if I was having a time value of like 20%, is going to be an inferior project to a, a, a project that's generating 23.5%, 23.6%. I thought this was more like their high star, the, the minimum that the company expects your PDM to be in the future. Yeah. And then if you calculate it in high, that's where you're going to break profit or even. So between the range of what they expect your PDM to be, so between 20 and 20. Uh, initially drew that graph at 
and then the bank would fund them that, and, and found that at 20% it still gave them a break even point, and then the bank told them to shift the assets to the right up to 23%, making anything in between 20 to 30 just as uh, so basically shifting the break even point towards 23%. So it's like making two separate graphs, and now you have to make a new analysis because you realize that the project, like you said, is better. So yeah, you're seeing a perspective of shifting that plot over to find that the 20% that the company's minimum is, if I understand you correctly, they take that 20% line, which is the company's minimum rate, and shift it over, shift this curve over, um, shift this blue line. Yeah. 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 Yeah.